welcome to Gaming the System. Do not adjust your sets. This is the show where four intersexual feminists talk about gaming through a feminist lens. Except this week there is a minor technical hitch that you may have noticed, and it was all my fault. I'm Caroline, by the way, the red-faced zombie on the bottom right corner, if you're watching the video. In my excitement to try out a new recording system, I failed to record my own audio. So this week you will just be hearing Jem, Matt and Alex as they talk about esports and why women are so underrepresented as part of them, while I occasionally dub over my inane question setting and try and remember what jokes and stories I told along the way. It's still going to be good, I promise, and I also promise not to make the same mistake twice. Anyway, on with the show. To kick off... Before moving on to the discussion of esports, I asked the team what games they've been playing this week. So, Matt, what have you been playing this week? Pokemon! Gotta catch them all! <laughs> I've uh, discovered. Uh, uh, let's. We'll, we'll pretend that I bought a. I bought a Game Boy Advance, and I've been playing Pokemon Emerald on a Game Boy Advance. Um, and I've been. Oh, it's so much fun! And this Game Boy Advance has a speed up function. So you can play it at like three times the speed. So instead of going, you go, <laughs> which makes it just makes the Pokemon experience even better. And it's, ah, oh, I love it. Love it, love it, love it. At this point, I interject some rather inaccurate statements about which Pokemon I would have been playing in the year 2001 in a flat in Camden Town. So I won't recreate them in full for you as Matt is going to correct me any second now about this. No, that was that was much older, I think. Um, so that the original ones were, I think, red, blue, and then silver, um, and then it was on Game Boy. Game Boy Advance was ruby, sapphire, and emerald. Oh, that was the, I think that was the first one I played. Jen, what games have you been playing this week? Oh, I've been playing so many things. <laughs> I've been playing. Um, um, I've been playing Stardew Valley, which has been lots of fun. I feel like I've turned a corner, and now I'm. I've, I've, I'm getting making some money and I just got to the end of the summer and I'm into autumn and I love a new season. It feels all fresh and clean and, and, and fun. So. Winter, of course, is the bleakest season in Stardew Valley. Yeah. Yeah, no, I did. I have. I, this is my third year, so I have, but I've just been really slow at doing everything. So I'm very behind on everything. Um, so, but I will be romancing Penny this winter, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I've also been playing um, Dragon Age, um, Age Inquisition, which has been lots of fun. And um, yeah, that's been really good. And then in a bit of potentially insanity i have started uh, world of warcraft shadowlands <laughs> which i think is bonkers and i'm not really sure why i'm doing it because it's <laughs> i'm going back to a place that i don't know whether i should go back to um but um obviously it's a it's the sort of new and improved world of warcraft and um yeah, it it's in, been interesting playing it because it looks how I remember the game looking, but I know that the graphics have been greatly improved. But it's how my memory of the game has been, you know, over the years. So it's, I found so, that with Crash yeah. Bandicoot and all yeah. remasters, really. It's how it's how you saw it when you were a child. How you record? Yeah, exactly. So for me, it's just like oh, I'm just playing in it. But it's um so far it's been quite fun. But I've only dipped in and dipped out. I I I'd probably. It's just a, a, it's just a phase. It's just a phase. <laughs> of course. The exact same feeling about the remastered version of Heroes and Might and Magic 3, where it looked exactly the same as I remember the original, but they do have a button you can press to see the actual original graphics. And every time I press that, I'd always end up sort of going, ooh. Now, Alex, what have you been playing? Apart from streaming, absolutely, obviously. Um, I have been, well, I picked up quite a bargain, actually, in the end of the January sale slash early February sale. And it's um, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, which is probably quite an interesting choice, given that we are mid-pandemic and the content of the game is all about what is essentially a village going into quarantine <laughs> because of this outbreak of a suspected flu but it's not really flu and you have to discover what happened to the little tiny fictional village of Yalton which is I think in possibly the north 
or made in England, but I'm not sure. They all have a mixture of accents. Some of them are Welsh for some reason. I don't quite know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was a very, very good game. And I finished it in probably about eight hours over two days. Eight and a half hours, maybe. And it was very affecting and very emotional. And you put a song You put a song from, I think it was probably you, you put a song from the soundtrack onto okay. our, um, yeah. our new that patented game system. That is what inspired system. me. Yes, we have a, a, play, a playlist of music on Spotify, which I will probably share on social media at some point. Um, yes, mm. yes. Um, Another but branch on the link tree. That is what inspired me to go looking for it in the store, because the soundtrack's just so... It is quite, it's quite choral, and um, there's definitely... Haunting. Yeah, a lot of themes within the game that revolve around faith and religion um which is interesting given that i'm not massively religious but it did make me think about that sort of thing and it kind of intersects also with science and and that sort of thing and indeed how, how we as humans deal with things like pandemics which is very interesting now thinking about it i think it came out in 2015 so if i'd played it when it came out i would have reacted differently i think to now <laughs> But yeah, definitely interesting. So in this section, I'm pretty sure I was describing the games that I've been playing over the last week. If you're watching the video version of this, there was probably no need for me to explain this, but if you are listening to the podcast edition, I should point out that I am a gesticulator and I am trying to recreate most of my memories of what I'm talking about from the various gesticulations that I'm making. I mean, when you're a teacher, unless you are stunningly unself-aware, you know what the kids' impressions of you are. And for me, it was always arms waving around. Anyway, I think that what I'm saying uh, is that I'm also playing Stardew Valley, as I'm really into the new update of the late game content. But I don't want to spoiler it for Gem, so I haven't talked about it too much. I've also been playing a lot of Deep Rock Galactic with my partner, as it is a great co-op gameplay uh, with dwarves and drinking and mining. Um, I think I also mentioned that I haven't played Rust for a bit, um, and that's unusual for me because I usually do play Rust most months, but I haven't done for a while. And now we start scheduling a live recording on White Night, I might not for a while. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I can't get over the adrenaline rush you get with Rush. Um, it's unlike any other game I've ever played. It's just unfortunately combined with probably one of the most toxic communities in the entire world of gaming. So yeah, mostly just being Stardew and Deep Rock Galactic, but also if there's any board game fans out there, I have been playing a lot of Wingspan, um, which is a game about birds on Tabletop Simulator. I've been playing it. Anyway. Um, that's enough of that. Let's find out what today's show is about. It is about esports. So, esports. The viewing figures often quoted for esports are 85% male and 15% female. It is a huge industry with million dollar prizes and all sorts of big shows and flash and jazz and all that sort of nonsense. But what are the barriers that are keeping women out of it? Is it neckbeards? Is it structural inequality? Or is it just that women aren't esports people? What do we think? It's the net. It's the same. There are no funny women. Argument. Say so there aren't any funny women. Have you ever met? Have you ever spoken to more than one woman? Have you? Because you're you're not finding them because you're not looking. And also, what has been back to the pandemic, been pissing the shit out of me off, is Jacinda Ardern is a stunning, incredible, powerful woman who has just led her country through the worst pandemic in 100 years. And there all opens up again, has, is a beacon of leadership. And everyone all over the world is going, oh, I, why, I wish she was our prime minister. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we just had her as our prime minister? Instead of going, there are millions of Jacinda Ardern's in every fucking country. But the reason they aren't in charge is because we have rigged bullshit systems that prop up lunatics, weak, straw, strong men, 
and people woefully unqualified, which is how you end up with a country of 70 million people with the fifth highest death rate of COVID in the world. Those, that's, those are the stakes. That's why we need to change the game so that someone like Mandu Reid should be the leader of the bloody country. And then just imagine how awesome that would be. And if you don't know who Mandu Reid is, Google her and follow her and support the shit out of her. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, like, Matt, there. Um, you know, we are all members of the Women's Equality Party. Excellent use of plugging Mandu Reid's name there. But, you know, back to the whole esports thing. Jem, what do you think? What's your views on what it is that's keeping women out of esports and why they're not taking part in the same numbers as young men, for example? Well, I think that one of my sort of bugbears about equality is this idea that women that we need to get more women into this male dominated area or more women into in doing that male dominated thing instead of looking at it and saying actually we need to just change the way we view things so you know i think it's i think it's a care is a really good example actually and topical from our homeschooled campaign at the weekend i can do it too um and um you know but we look at care and we say you know that 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 care is under undervalued and therefore you know we need to get more women into other workplaces and things like that but no actually we need to raise the value of care we need to recognize that just because it's a classically female role doesn't mean it's not as valuable and i think that we need to apply the same thing to esports so when we said we were going to talk about esports today I was like, I don't really know anything about esports because it, it, it focuses on the sorts of games that I do not play. I've never had any interest in them. I just don't enjoy them. So, but then I started thinking, well, could we actually bring in other games? And are we just looking at esports the wrong way? Are esports male dominated because they have traditionally been played by men and therefore choose games that appeal more to the male gamers? And could actually, rather than bringing more women in to play these male-dominated games, could we not just expand the the gamut of games available so that it opens it up to a wider audience? And I think, you know, so I sort of feel like we can look at it the other way around. On the WhatsApp, you meant... Sorry, I was just going to say, on the what? On the what? Sorry, you're waiting for me to speak. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. Um, so on on the WhatsApp gem, you made a fantastic point about um, there being, I think, that's rare. <laughs> no, no. You said something like, uh, "If there isn't, if there, it was one of the games you played. I can't remember what it was. It was something like Overcooked or something. If only there was a way to make yeah. play a one game like Overcooked. Yeah. And it's it just that just blew my mind. It made me yeah. think. There, you, there's a way to play anything competitively if you're, of there is. if yeah. you're like, the, you have to be bold and create these things. But the only reason shooting games and driving games and fighting games are so popular is because it's the men who play them who go, I want to compete in this. But yeah, what yeah. you actually suggested was The Sims. That was, that was it. Yeah. yeah, that was it. Yeah. Like I really enjoyed that yeah. idea of a competition of who can get promoted to the top of a career ladder or find their partner first in The Sims. All that sort of stuff would be great, Larks. I agree with that also. There's definitely a lot of games within esports that I've just never even heard of, let alone played. And I think there is a very sort of masculine culture around esports. And I was going to answer your question with another question of mine, which is, do you think that there's a sort of um, almost a gatekeeping around esports as who as to who's allowed to compete and who's who's um, seen as acceptable as being on an, uh, a professional esports player. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I really, I, I really, I, I'm, I'm really feeling puffed up about this. Which sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I keep on like interrupting yeah, and interjecting. Yeah, that's good. But um, um. Fuck, I've forgotten it now. 
was making yeah. me think about was the only sport which I'm into, which is snooker, and how the reason that's often cited for why there aren't enough women at the top of the game is women rarely have the luxury of devoting themselves to 18 hours a day practice on what is considered a very niche area, especially when you consider things like the statistical burden of care that tends to fall on women across the spectrum. Was, um, also add but in... doesn't that apply to any to any yeah. specialization to any sport and to any i, would I mean so, you yeah. know, like if you want to, yeah if you're trying to break into a sport you also need the money to do that as well if you're following tournaments around the world you've got to be able to move around with those tournaments um i don't know if that's the same for esports i don't know whether that moves around the world i need to look more into that but it's definitely something you need to consider if you're wanting to break into something like a sport professionally, you have to be able to go where the competition is. For example, Zoe Summer, who's a Scottish StarCraft player and part of the British eSports women team, has had to move to Korea because that's where the tournaments are and that's where the sponsorship is. There are, I mean, there are long hours of work, there's problems with people taking drugs to stay awake and concentrate, but then you look at the money that there is to be made from these competitions, like $10 million being available for winning yeah. an International League of Legends tournament, and it's like not surprising that some people do want to do this. I mean, it appeals to me, the idea of winning a shit ton of money for playing games, but it's still not an environment that seems very supportive. I don't know what I asked Matt here, but here's his answer coming up anyway. I have. I have, yes. And it, it goes again into the reason why there aren't women gamers, the reason why there aren't so many um, uh, female politicians, the reason um, women are left out in so many areas is one, the system that exists that is built to prop up men and accelerate men through. I'm very proud of this analogy of like um, straight white men, cisgender men, uh, think they're all really cool warriors going around playing war, but they're playing paintball. And the people like women, women of colour, trans people, people who are marginalised, they're play they're they're using real bullets. Um so that's why they're that's that's the stakes are so much different. But the men, because they built the system, they're going, so oh, yeah, we're the best, we're fighting the hardest. And what letting it become an actual meritocracy is, is it exposes the mediocrity of the vast majority of people who are in positions they have absolutely no qualification to be in, no right to be in. And so it's best to just keep that. Those people don't count. They, it doesn't matter how good they are. They don't count. We're the best. And that's, that's what this, that's what this conversation has brought up to me. It's the idea of the, the mediocrity that, that just is spread everywhere. And there are so many incredible people like Mandu Reed. I'll bring her up again. That that should be. Imagine how they would soar if they were in the positions that they should be in. At this point, I am about to ask Jen. As a parent, would she be okay with her daughter becoming an esports competitor? And then what happened was what we thought was the first technical hitch of the night. As my overstretched computer, uh, I am trying to get one of the new graphics cards, but they're never in stock. And it's not, it's really annoying. Anyway, uh, my computer went into meltdown basically and shut down. So, but anyway, I shall now cut in the other side where Gem answers how she would feel about her daughter taking the path of an esports competitor. Well, I was pretty horrified when she came home and told me that she'd been playing um, Widowmaker on Fortnite. No, not Fortnite, Overwatch. Um, and um, so I feel like those games, the games that are popular in esports are very violent and um, very fast and all of those things. So I think I'd be concerned about it. But based on what you were saying about the, the performance enhancing drugs and the the lifestyle and i know that it is it's a case of you often have to go physically to an arena and play there and it's a very male dominated um industry as we've said and it just all of these things just would not to me feel like a conducive place for my daughter to be in and i'm i think of myself as pretty pro games and and pretty um hardcore in my approach to gaming so i so i think that i can't imagine parents whose children who, parents who don't come from a gaming background being very comfortable with it at all especially if it involved lots of money as well and time and all of that matt have you ever thought you'd like to be an esports competitor 
Um, in the sort of like, you know, where you look at something like, well, Victoria Corrin poker, uh, Victoria Corrin Mitchell with poker, you just say she made a million dollars from one game. So I can't, can't I just sit in that game table and do that? But um, no, it's one of those, it's one of those, I, I like stories. I've never cared about um, competitive stuff, really, not in gaming. Um, thinking about, um, I listen to a podcast called Crime in Sports which is about criminal athletes, and they are monsters. Utter monsters is unbelievable. Um, and a lot of them, well, a certain number of them, deal with molestation of um, athletes, of particularly younger athletes. So just because esports is based on computers, it has all of the dangers of any other kind of sport. Um, if you're traveling somewhere, if you're in a an environment that is male dominated, that is run by gatekeepers who have the power to say, uh, they're not really a good team player, we'll choose the girl who doesn't say anything when I when I sexually abuse them. Um so that's that's again, it's it's important to recognize the dark sides of of all these things with gaming that like you were saying, Jem, um, that the world just because it's gaming, it doesn't make it any different from the way the rest of the world works. Yeah, I mean, that's all true, but $10 million really does appeal. But, of course, I'd never win it because I just like to have fun when I'm playing games. I mean, I love Hearthstone, which is the closest I come to playing one of the eSport games out there. And even then, like I get criticised heavily because I play it for fun. I'm not constantly worrying about having the best deck, looking up strats. Um, I just play for fun. I don't mind that I lose a lot. Um, it's it's that's not what it's about for me. Alex, how about you? Does it appeal to you the the idea of uh, playing in an esports competition, being an esports god of some sort? In the same way as when I watch a quiz on TV and, and I get the answer right, I'm thinking. Well, if I was there, I'd win this much money. So, yeah, in the same way as Matt said, really. But again, I think if there were games that I played and uh, ways of playing those games in a competitive way, I would probably be more tempted. But again, I don't know. Not, not I haven't ever thought about it in a serious way because of... I realise now that um, what I actually did was rudely interrupt Alex at this point just yeah. to raise the bugbear that I'd wanted to mention, which was the British Esports <laughs> logo, yeah. which is a lion with a stern, serious face, whereas the British Esports women's logo Very is... Very much like the Olympics. Indeed, is a lioness. Um, and the lioness has her mouth open and this sort of really whiny, naggy look on her face, whereas the lion has this sort of stern, serious face. So that's what I'm doing right now there is the whiny, naggy face sort of thing compared to the stern, serious face of the British mm. esports lion. They just can't help it. They can't help it. Every single time there's this new thing. Oh, we'll see how it turns out. And they always go... Ah, oh, we just had a little bit of sexism in there. I can't help it. And I can't remember at which point I said this during the show, but I'm filling it in in this gap, is that people really often talk about the need for mentors for women and creating a women's space, when in reality it's the men that need mentoring and it's the spaces that already exist with men in them that need to change. So rather than sort of siphoning women off to have their own lioness symbol, you need to question why it is that women don't want to be in the main esports game because it's not usually women, it's usually just marginalised communities. Anyway... No, I was I was interrupting you. I I think that you've hit the nail on the head. I think the issue is that it's the system needs to change, and that's why we're gaming the system because the system needs to change because the system is fundamentally flawed. And and what it always comes down to, whenever um, organisations try to fix it, is actually what they do is they say it's the women's fault. You know, it's the minority group's fault. It's, you know, this is why there's not enough of this group in our in our business is because they aren't confident enough to step forward and ask for a raise or ask for that job or to join in in those games. They 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 don't want to look at the fact that the system is is rigged against these groups of people because it is 
it because it has been designed for and by men and they run it and they want to to keep it that way in intentionally and unintentionally and i think that's the thing it's so it's it's fundamentally flawed i think and that's that's and that's a much bigger fix that's a much harder fix isn't it to sit down and go like you say why don't women want to work for this company why don't women want to play in esports what is it about these esports games that mean they are not the sort of games that we play or that women play? Why are these games just just not welcoming to newcomers, just not something that you kind of want to dive in at? For me, it's just... Um... I get motion sick actually is probably <laughs> the biggest problem i find the first person shooters really difficult to do i mean i did actually play quake through quake is one of the few games that i did actually finish um back in the olden days um and you know but that was about the only first person that i really was able to to cope with and then it just got it got too fast and 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 i think the other problem is is that if you play in um environment where you've got like other players attacking you or whatever it's very difficult to learn because you're dead all the time i mean that was what happened to me when i i i would log in to play these games or if i did pvp um or anything like that in in world of warcraft i would i would just die all the time and i never got it just wasn't fun it wasn't i think for me it's always been story-based games has been something that appeals to me and these games do not um so, but I can see why people might quite like to watch them because there's a lot going on and there's a lot of action. So I can see the appeal for some people in in it. But for me, extreme violence, gratuitous violence, l no story. It's just I just find it frustrating and I don't find it fun. But I I have known and loved many people who have found it a lot of fun. So I'm not knocking it. It just doesn't work for me. I actually find that because I've always been okay with being terrible at actual sport, I'm kind of okay with being terrible at esports. And the constant losing and getting killed doesn't actually get me down all the time. But I mean, equally, it doesn't endear me to a game if you just keep losing, losing every time you like go into it, and it doesn't make you want to keep going <laughs> with it. So no, I totally see that argument, and I can understand why, especially your sort of Fortnite games and stuff, if all you're doing is just getting shot instantly, you're not going to want to play much more. Um, well, for me, mainly it's a, uh, a chip on my shoulder, like I have with um, games that want credit for having a female protagonist when they give you the choice to play as either a male or a female protagonist. It's the uh, online games, uh, massive open world games um, and games like Destiny, they have their, their cop-outs because they don't, they're not creating a story. They're not creating a narrative to hang the quality of the game on. They create a gameplay loop, go, here you go, do this loop, and then the players create their own like enjoyment rather than going, I've built this 40-hour epic God of War story and you will you will experience this and everything every single impression you have of it will be because of something that we've created so that's why i've i've, I've never really that's why it irritates me a bit um as far as um another reason why um women might be deterred from those kinds of places because the the loudness and proudness of the angry aggressive cruel um male presence that is so so widely strewn over every area of the internet that um if if you think oh i like to play call of duty if you want to be the best the absolute best at something you need to have you need to be able to go into it and give it your all all the time to um but if you know in the back of your head that if i go online here and try and organize with one of my friends there's probably going to be some dickhead in the chat who's going to call you a stupid bitch or say uh, he wants to find your house and rape you. If you've got that in the back of your head, then that's going to that has to do something, even if it's not conscious. It's going to chip away at uh, your your love of wanting to pursue that thing because that's what mm -hmm. happens to women in any walk of life. 
they say you want this thing you've got to you've got to fight through in that system in order to get to what you want you can't just stop you can't get there without having to go through the swamp that exists there already and the swamp creatures that inhabit it alex do you agree <laughs> yeah no well i think when when i think about first person shooters they don't generally appeal to me because they stress me out quite a lot um the one experience i've had of of hearing online chat was actually in gta 5 when it just automatically did it when you go into online mode unless you turn it off and i just was like oh god no there's loud strangers in my ears it just freaked me out and scared me and i i just didn't feel very comfortable it felt like an invasion of privacy in some ways um but no in terms of first person shooters i also don't like the feeling of knowing there's an actual human behind the other person that's attacking you it feels not well, it always feels personal in a way even though it's well i suppose it's personal because <laughs> they are trying to kill you but um and then also what was the other thing i don't like losing and i'm not very good <laughs> i'm not very good at first person shooters so i like i say i usually die all the time or only kill one person and when i see myself at the bottom of the table i don't feel very good and i want to play games that i enjoy playing and those aren't the types of games that I enjoy. I think what happened here is that I went on yet another rambling anecdote about Rust because I can't avoid bringing it up all the time. But also, I'm probably like the only person who plays these sort of games out of the group. Um, I am rubbish at PvP, but I get a lot of fun out of the game by playing it my way. And the heightened tension you get playing Rust, even on like a really quiet server where you're th thinking, right, I'm out chopping down a tree or just gathering some stone. But at any moment, you could lose all your gear and have to just defend yourself or you know run away really fast, jump on a horse. Um, but it just gives an adrenaline rush that I have never had from any other game or any other experience online like that. But yeah, no, I am rubbish at PvP, which is why I tend not to take my good gear out with me, which is probably why I lose anyway. But, you know, bow and arrow and some burlap sack clothes don't feel too bad about losing those. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and uh, just backing off what, what you were saying, when women, men, men are told, drive for the best, be the best, be the biggest and best and strongest, and women, are, their messaging is, oh, just stay small, just be okay. Because when women make themselves large they become targets and they are putting themselves in the crosshairs of these men who are going, you're in our place, you're not allowed here. Slight segue, but one of the things that has occurred to me or struck me about women in gaming so far is that the women who do stream um, and the women you sort of see competing in esports, the sort of women you see streaming on Twitch and getting a lot of viewers, they seem to be expected to sort of overly conform to the societal ideas of what femininity, femininity, fem, that's such a hard word to say, but the societal ideas of what femininity really is. And so the most successful ones, you know, they've got their hair and their makeup done. And when people share their battle stations on the Gamer Girls subreddit, they're all pink and they're shiny and... They've got little cat ears on their headsets. So I'll try and like sync this up with the bit of video where I actually do the cat ears symbol and stuff like that. I mean, Zoe Summers, she has got cat ears on her headphones on her picture. There's hat. There's me doing it on her picture on the British esports woman's page. And obviously, if people want to be pink and shiny, that's totally fine. Like I'm okay with people being pink and mm -hmm. shiny, but it feels like it's almost only okay for you to be a gamer girl if you conform to be the girliest gamer girl you can be and just sort of stay in that box of being a woman. I mean, I don't know if that's just me who's taken that away. Um, and, you know, I wonder if other people think the same. No, I've, I've actually been thinking about it. I had a, had, had a look into... Um, um, I was actually having a look at that list of the top um, black female streamers um that you shared the other day and 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 a lot of uh, i was noticing that a lot of the streamers have a real um there's a real look 
there's it, it's it's not is it they're not look the same they don't all look the same but there's definitely a yeah there's there's definitely quite a lot of pressure put on 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 the female streamers to have a yeah have a have a look whatever that look might be whereas I, I a lot of the male streamers don't they just seem to sit at their desks with a the mic so i i think there is kind of a pressure on on women in that world to maybe be more feminine to to make themselves perhaps perhaps as you were saying matt to make themselves less um threatening themselves less deborah francis white deborah francis white on the guilty feminist was once telling a story about this like incredible savant ceo and they were bringing him in and he just dresses like a slob all the time and they had to dress him up and train him up to to look presentable and but he'd risen to like the top of his profession whilst being like that and she pointed out a woman wouldn't even get in the door if she wasn't wearing makeup or looking good or having her hair done pointing out that that men just they just you can just wander in and think oh yeah this this place looks good I'll I'll camp out here. And a woman, before she even starts, the message is you have to have a look. You can go with pink. You can do your hair in a certain way, do a cutesy pose, and then then you go from there. It's always about presenting yourself how someone wants you to be rather than just getting to be yourself, which is so much more relaxing. Tingly. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. I've just come to realise the last couple of years, actually, it kind of started the last couple of job interviews I've had. I haven't worn makeup and I got the job. Um, not to post or anything. But, uh, um, and then at that point, I was like, well, actually, well, that's OK, because if men can go to job interviews and not wear makeup, why can't I? And then I thought about streaming. I just have been, as I am now, without any makeup on or anything, just sitting on my bed playing games and it's fine um so i know i do understand that there is a pressure because i have had other women talk about the pressure and intimate that i should be fitting into a certain box at certain stages of my life as well um so there is certainly it is real and it exists but once you free yourself from that idea and that box it is quite liberating it, it, even if it's a very small step, just like not wearing makeup or whatever, <laughs> anything you want to do to to just be like not pressured into presenting yourself a certain way is is a is a positive step. I feel. Certainly. It will shock you to your core to know that I do not wear makeup for these shows. <laughs> um, my radioactive cheeks are just a natural product <laughs> of my drinking and the poor lighting <laughs> setup that I have here. Uh, anyway, so before we move on to the wild card question of the show, ooh, is there anything more you want to say about esports, women's exclusion from it, or just generally the whole area that I haven't given you a chance to raise yet in this show? I've got uh, one thing. I found a really cool article about an esports team that was made up entirely of, I think, paraplegics and quadriplegics which is where you can either only use one half of your limbs or none of your limbs. Um, and one of them, one of the team is a woman. And her name is... I'll find it. I'm trying to read through the article here. As ever, always ultra-prepared. Uh, Nairi Stevens. And I've got some quotes here uh, where she talks about how she got into esports and just generally how she feels about it. She said... Um, how video games have become an important part of her life since she acquired her disability, so to speak. Um, it helps me get my independence back to be able to play. When she joined the team, she was the only woman. You know what boys are like with their games, she says. They live for gaming, but I'm getting up there with them. Which I thought was an interesting quote, really, mm -hmm. because it kind of shows that she wants to put herself on that kind of stage and, and be a part of it and be proud of it being there essentially they all play with the, their mouths by the way which i think is really cool absolutely adaptive technology is one mm. of those other things we need to be talking about at some point I suppose uh, when you anything else before the wild card question matt no i've said I've it got all. Uh, one thing that... <laughs> 
I uh, I mentioned this when uh, we were when you'd uh, had a bit of a tech meltdown, um, and I'll say it again because it's, it's it's quite impactful to me. I um, used to play Time Crisis in the arcade all the time, and I got to the point where I could complete the game on one pound that I put in. And um, there's a, a a like the the top like the list of scores, and the top five get to go on the screen when the game's not being played. And I would always be number six. That's as close as I got to esports, and it, it actually makes me really sad, really sad remembering it. That's gutting. I really used to love Time Crisis too on the PlayStation. Really good co-op multiplayer me, yeah. experience. There's just not enough of those. So, right, it is time for the wild card question, um, and I'm going to ask you: If you were stuck on a desert island and you could only have one game to play. What would it be? So you can have it on console or PC. Um, you can't have an internet. You can't have an internet connection, so it's only one game. Although that would knock out so many games that are MMO experiences. So all right, maybe you can have the internet, but only for that game that you are playing. Can you talk to other people? No, we're women in gaming, so we always have our mics off anyway. <laughs> So, what would that one game be? Tough question. I'm not sure what my answer is yet. What do you think? Unsurprisingly, I'd go with the PlayStation game. How long are we on the desert island for? You don't know. It could be forever. Maybe nobody's going to rescue you. Well, my, my initial thing is to go with God of War, the latest one. But I fear that if you played only that game forever, you'd go a bit mad and start hating it which i which i couldn't abide um in that case it would probably have to be i'd hit myself on the head with a rock so i could i could forget the games that i played already before and then i'd probably do death stranding <laughs> i because i at this point i'm feeling pretty smug and seeing the weaknesses and limitations of story games compared to the more open world games that i like to play so alex i've got one in mind i don't know i guess you could say it's a bit of both but I did say at the time when I played it that if I could only play this game forever, I'd be happy. And it's probably Assassin's Creed Origins. Being the Egyptology student that I am. Uh, yes, it was. Um, it's quite large. It's basically the top half of Egypt. And then if you've Jeez. got the DLC, the bottom half of Egypt. Um, or some of it anyway, not all of it. But um, I just absolutely loved that game in ways that that went a lot deeper than probably your non-Egyptologist gamer would appreciate because I could appreciate, like, even when you have conversations with people, they would use Egyptian words and I'd understand what they mean and I'd read things on the walls and understand what they mean and understand all these little things about the world and how people behaved and the class systems and the jobs that people had and like there was this all these layers of understanding that I got out of it and I knew they'd work really hard on putting it in there so I could appreciate it so much on so many levels oh I know this has been really hard um I, I can I can I give two answers <laughs> I don't yeah. want to take two games but two <laughs> two, <laughs> two options um I think I would probably take a game like my time in portia or stardew valley because there's so much longevity to those games they just go on forever and ever and they're, they're just gathery games and buildy games and so i think it would it that would keep me busy um but i i would also like to take a um like a text adventure designer <laughs> or instead take because my my heart is is in the mud mud world from multi user dungeons from that was where I started gaming and 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 I helped to design a game so the idea of creating these worlds and and creating the games you could build a game and play your game and build another game and play another game so i think that that might be and I, it's one of those things that i i found one actually online that you can use to do that now um and i think that's something that would i would love to do but i just don't have have the time to to put into it but yeah if i was on a desert island i would have plenty of time and it wouldn't need fancy graphics either so no children else yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jem, I've I've written down another quote from you, which is, "My heart is in the mud." Yeah. <laughs> My heart is in the mud. You're yeah. a quote machine, Jimmy. <laughs> what Jem's just said actually gave me a thought, which is that during the first lockdown, well, I mean, we've never actually left lockdown, but anyway, back in March, when the first stages of this pandemic hit, and we were all enthusiastic about what we were going to achieve with our time at home. I signed up for an online course to learn Unity and I really should have stuck with it because then I could take Unity with me to the desert island and make Clever. any game I want, you see. Um, but realistically, I would be choosing RimWorld because I love that game and it has endless playability, especially if I'm allowed mods. And I never tire of starting a scenario in Winworld and seeing how it plays out. But I mean, I suppose if you look at the number of hours of gameplay I've got on Steam, I've got over 700 hours on Rimworld and just over 1,100 hours on Rust. So you'd think Rust would be the one that I would take, but I don't know. I just don't think I'd enjoy it on my own as much. And the toxicity of the environment probably wouldn't really help with the desert island blues so yeah i'm sticking with rim world as my choice post-apocalyptic rebuilding on a planet and keeping cute pets i think that's the way we should all be heading in this direction on the theme of the um uh learning how to use game development engines i've i've been learning piece by piece how to use the unreal engine over the last i think three years now and i've got a, like a, a list of uh, game ideas that I've been fleshing out that I'm so excited about, but my only limit is being able to, um, the actual technical skill to be able to do it. And with something like Unreal Engine and Unity Engine, they are um, one of the reasons I think so much fantastic art is being created at the minute is because uh, it's the avenues are accessible. Um, so we have, with podcasting, we have seized the means of production. We don't need radio. We don't need a, a station. That's why The Guilty Feminist is so incredible, because you just go, I'm just going to book a book a theatre with 30 people with my mate and make something incredible. And it's the same with um, game creation now, because with, with Unity and Unreal in particular, they are AAA game engines. The Arkham Batman games were made on the Unreal engines. And now um, people with uh, the mindset who want to get into those industries, they don't need to to join a massive company that's run by men as we've been run by men. And it's it's yeah, it's an exciting time to be um, seeing all these industries that real the brilliance of the population at large is able to shine through. Brilliant. So you can create the gaming the system game when the time comes then. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. So that brings us to the end of the show. So Matt, what is it you need to say? Oh, not the my heart is in the mud. Oh, no, that no. The, sorry, that, that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's the thing that I like, can never get right. Like, share and subscribe. <laughs> yes. So please. please do like, share and subscribe. Um, and we you have to ring... You have to ring the little bell as well so you get notifications yes. for when we go live. Yes, absolutely. We've been gaming the system and I haven't come up with a good sign-off catchphrase yet. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>